Okay, so thank you, Julio. Um, yes, so yes, I'm the experimentalist of the band. Uh, that's the one at the back that makes a lot of noise. Um, so, um, so Julio asked me to, to tell you about so experiments that are not really new. These are experiments that were, uh, I mean, happening mostly was I was still in uh, in Seva Sacle. Ah, because ah yes, because there is a problem of the. Uh, okay. Okay. So I will tell you about experiments that um, were made uh, by this gentleman here, uh, three of my uh, former PhD students, and um, results that were discussed with the, this gentleman here. And Bob Beringer provided some of the, the, the incremental materials. Uh, and I will tell you about granular media experiments. Uh, okay, so, and the idea will be to discuss glassy behavior and uh, jamming things uh, in granular media experiments. So, this one should start. Okay, so, jamming in glasses, I will go, of course, very fast, but I would like to say a little, a few words about why uh, studying jamming in vibrated grains, because as you will see, there will always be some kind of dynamics in my, uh, in my uh, experiments. And I'm interested in, the, in two things. The dynamics approaching the granular glass, so you make your packing of glass denser and denser while you are shaking them, and I will try to argue you that it's a quite a good glass uh, former uh, system. And in there, we will discuss I mean, the advantages of these granular experiments that they are also two-dimensional, so you can really follow the dynamics of all the grains with a very high uh, resolution. And so we will see uh, how is really the dynamics in real space. So, I mean, the motivation for this experiment is really to understand what's going on uh, in a small dimension, like here two or three. Um, and so the advantage of these things is that we can really follow <coughs> what hap what's happening. Uh, this was not a good idea to have this ice cream with these little nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and we we'll discuss the relation between short time dynamics, where the particles move from one place to another place quite suddenly, which are called K jumps. And they have to do this in a cooperative way, because of course it is so dense that they cannot do this uh, just individually. And how this relates to these dynamical heterogeneities that were uh, introduced by uh, Ludovic uh, in his, in his uh, lessons. Then I will move essentially to another topic which is not approaching the granular glass, but now you will be deep in the glass, and I will study jamming in a gently vibrated granular media. And there we will see that what is important is really the dynamics of the contacts between the particles, that are, these contacts that are forming and opening permanently. Okay, and I'm afraid if you want to stop in time to go to the bigorno, there won't be anything about heat stress and nonlinear rheology, but if you're interested, I can show you some more things. Okay, so, you would have been here something like 10 years ago. Um, you would have heard that, okay, jamming uh, somehow uh, encompass every system that behave like slow, crowdy, uh, sluggy, uh, stuck, rigid, all these kinds of words, with illustrations like mayonnaise for the bureau and uh, cappuccino, foams, and so on. Um, and I will try to disentangle a little bit these two, these different phenomena. I think it's a, it's a matter of a very general interest since, for instance, when you travel uh, every day and you take the air, the, 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 the plane, uh, you see that some people still have really fundamental questions, <laughs> even in the everyday life. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Let's take from first the point of view of jamming. So the point of view of jamming, jamming is a very well-defined concept. You consider a packing of spheres, zero temperature, no dynamics, and you just wonder whether you can pack them or not given the packing fraction. So at loose packing fraction, it's easy, there is place, there is no cost of overlapping the particle. At high packing fraction, there is a cost for overlapping the particles. There is a packing fraction where you are just on the verge between these two regimes, and this is jamming. You can do this with very hard spheres, then you will never be able to explore these configurations. You will be stuck there, and essentially your mechanical pressure will be zero before the jamming transition, infinite at the jamming transition. Or you can do it with soft spheres, and then you will, it will be zero before the jamming transition, and then the pressure will increase depending on the potential. And if you rescale it well, Andrea showed you that 
the, the, the scaling does not depend on the shape of the potential. OK, then you can also count the contacts amongst the particles. And here, obviously, there is zero contact. And here, there is just the, the uh, isostatic number of contact. And then, uh, eventually, there is more. And there is an increase of this number of contact precisely at jamming. So you have this jump from 0 to some finite value, here around 4 because we are in two dimension. And then it increases with a power law, which is close to 1 half, but is, which is not exactly 1 half. OK, so no dynamics. Essentially, a problem of satisfying constraints introducing the next seminar. Um, and that's it. Um, so this is relevant for situations like these ones. This is a very old experiment, 1727, where Mr. Hales was packing green peas to study the mechanical properties of these things for biological reasons. He was actually studying jamming. Um, much recent, uh, more recent experiments are those that I will also use, which are photoelastic grains. <laughs> and these photoelastic grains, when they are in contact and when they are deformed, by using cross polarizers, you can figure out where they are deformed and by how much. And so this way, you can evaluate the forces in these kinds of packing. But you also have experiments with uh, emulsions. These are experiments by Yasna. I don't know if Yasna is around. And these are uh, experiments with foams that were done in Leiden by the team of Martin Van Eken. So this is really this jamming, zero temperature, no dynamics problem. OK. Then, and you can ask yourself many questions there. What is the distribution of these forces, et cetera, et cetera? I will not discuss this uh, here. I'm interested in this question. If you, instead of using these big grains, which don't move by themselves, you take colloids, which experience Brownian motion, or if you take grains that flow because you impose an external uh, potential uh, slope or gravity, uh, there will be dynamics. And the questions I want to, to discuss a little bit is by how much the dynamics is controlled by the scaling of jamming that Andrea has discussed at length. That is, for example, here you have a pile of beads. You incline it. It starts flowing. Obviously, here they don't flow really. So this is really jammed. Here they flow already very fast. But in this region, you have a rheology that can be very complicated because you may be influenced by the, uh, the criticality of jamming. So that's, uh, that's a question of interest. Conversely, what are the effects of dynamics on, on a jam system? Uh, namely, if I take the system I was presenting before, this one, very, very close to that. And now I shake it. So here, I don't feel my contact. But if I shake it when it's very, very close, where the gaps are very small, I will feel the contact. So by how much will these dynamics tell me anything about what's going up, up here? OK. So that's from the point of view of jamming. But there is also another point of view, which is the one of glass. So you've heard from Francesco during these weeks uh, that the, for hard spheres, you have this, and from Ludovic, that you have this, this phase diagram 1 over the rescale pressure as a function of uh, the rescale uh, packing fraction in mean field in, uh, in infinite dimension, that there is this, this liquid state, super cooled, super compressed. And then, well, you can do state following, compress, and follow a glass. And uh, you heard, I think, during the last lecture of uh, Francesco that at some point, this phase may experience another transition, and you enter a more complicated glass. And this up to the point where, yeah. at the end, the, the, the pressure will be infinite and you reach jamming for these hard sphere systems. OK, so that's, that's for hard spheres. But you can also have this for soft spheres. So this is a diagram that comes, I think, from one paper by Ludovic, where you have the temperature in log scale nodes as a function of the packing fraction. Ludovic has shown this, not having this in log scale. And you had the straight line uh, that was telling you that temperature and packing fractions are the same for uh, WCA potential. But so anyhow, you have here the liquid. And here, progressively, you become glassy, right? So this is this orange line in this diagram is this dynamical transition here, except instead of being a point, it's now a line. Now, there will be all this phase here, which is this stable glass. And then, well, you can start from one of your favorite glass along this green line, one of these points. You can compress it or cool it, do what you want, and try to approach the jamming of this glass, if it exists. And you may wonder whether something bizarre will arrive here. So in this uh, seminar, I will tell you about two different things. One will be, OK, this, is a, this will be the first part of the seminar. 
I take grains, I shake them quite strongly. So let's say it's not temperature, but it's okay, kinetic energy. It's quite large. The packing fractions are not that high, and I compress. And so I will explore what happens when I enter this glassy state. That's the first step. In the second part, I will really prepare a glass that is glass for glass, that is, it will not evolve anymore in terms of structure. And then I will try to compress it or decompress it or make bizarre protocols with the packing fraction, but around this point. And that will be the second part. Okay, so two quite different questions. Glassy dynamics and dynamics very close to jamming. Okay. Is that clear what we are heading at? Okay. So, let's start with a very first experiment that was not so clever. Um, I will tell you why. Um, that we did uh, in Saclay where, okay, we had very hard disks. These are uh, metallic disks. And they are put in this cell. Okay, now it's, it's compressed. It's really dense. The packing fraction is like 0 0.82. Yes, 8.27. Um, nothing moves. So now you want to explore the phase, the configurations around this one. But this one is really a, a random configuration. I mean, this is, there's no equilibration of any kind. It's just a packing of, amongst all the possible packings you can think of. Um, and for some bizarre reason, we decided to to do this by shearing a little bit this packing, and then we come back at the original angle. So you see that when you shear, the grains will move with respect to another a little bit because you impose some shear, and then you come back. So if the shear is completely trivial, when you come back, you erase everything that you have done. And this will be true if you make very, very tiny angle. Then if you increase the angle a little bit more, at some point you will make displacements, relative displacements between the particles that are called non-affine, which means that when you come back, you don't erase them. And then you will do this like 10,000 times, 15,000 times, I mean, a lot of uh, many, many, many cycles, and everything is quasi-static. So it's extremely controlled. That's the, the, that was the idea at that time. And you look at the dynamics from one configuration to another each time when you have to come back. Okay, so you don't care about what's going on during the cycle. It's really like uh, stroboscopic dynamics. And the angle for all what I will tell about uh, to today is 5 degrees, so it's pretty small. Okay, when you do this, you measure the mean square displacement of your particles, and what you see is that, okay, at long time it's diffusive, as you, as you would expect, but there is, at intermediate time here, a subdiffusive regime. So that's the square root of the mean square displacement. And also, if you look at the distributions of this displacement, rescales by their uh, average value, you see that the distributions are not Gaussian uh, for different lag times that you take. It, it, it's, it's really hard for them to become Gaussian, even if it, they are more Gaussian when you increase the, the lag time. OK, so far so good. So there, there are non-trivial dynamics when you do this with these grades. And the time scale of the shear? It's quasi-static. Uh, so th this is a number of, of, sh of cycles. So the, the shear itself is super slow. I mean, as compared to what we are discussing here. Okay. So there is no inertia. It's a fully over yeah. system. That was more or less the motivation behind all this, to have something very, very uh, well controlled. Yeah. OK. Do you have a reason for the initial subdiffusion? Sorry? Do you have a reason for the initial subdiffusion? That's what we are looking for. OK, so we say, OK, we have non-Gaussian dynamics, a subdiffusive regime, so the system seems to have a hard time to decorrelate, and uh, the question is why? What's going on? But it's, remember, it's pretty dense. Uh, the, the frequency of the cycle is, is constant. Yes. So Again, the time, the time of the shear doesn't matter. It's the zero frequency limit. It's really quasi-static. You really force the systems to go in another configuration and come back. So why is this experiment a little bit dumb? It's because if you try to increase the angle, or if you cr try to increase the packing fraction, the stress that you have to impose to shear this crazy material becomes very, very high. Look already the size of these metallic blades here. While the grains are four millimeter grains, and even so, this, this, this thing here, which is like three centimeter diameter, would bend if you, uh, if you insist on uh, shearing it too much. 
Okay, so that's why it was not a very good experiment, that you cannot tune any parameter almost. Yes. So the top graph you are measuring. It's maybe we don't finish in time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're measuring. You said you're measuring the 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 uh, mean squared displaced displacement of all the particles. Yes. How do you measure? Do you just, like track them all? And yeah, yeah. You have a camera. You oh, track them all. Okay. Okay. So that's way to do. Okay. That's. I mean, fifteen years ago, it was <laughs> the limit of what you could do with camera and computer. But because it's quasi static, you have all your time. Okay. <laughs> well, all the time. Uh, okay. So. We use the same kind of tools as the one you would use to study glass. We define the local overlap function, which, uh, because we are not uh, in periodic boundary conditions, we don't like the Fourier space. But what we say is the same. is that It's a function that says that if the displacement of the particle on a time scale tau is larger than a length scale a, this will be 0. And if it's smaller, this will be 1. So this is something that is 1 or 0, depending whether we have moved more than a in a time scale tau or not. Okay, so that's really equivalent to what is introduced when you want to compute the dynamical uh, structure factor. You average this over all the particles and over the initial time. And when you do this, well, you see that you have a decorrelation that it, this is the log of the time that is a, a stretch exponential. Um, okay, so indeed there is slow dynamics in this system. Uh, so now the question is, what does it look like in real space? So in real space, you can really look at this field. And when you look at this field, and you color it by its intensity between 0 and 1, what you see is that there are regions that have moved a lot. These are the blue regions. So this quantity is 0, and there are regions which have not moved. Okay, so the dynamics is heterogeneous. So that was the first time we observed really dynamical heterogeneities in a system that exhibit some kind of glassy dynamics. Uh, and uh, uh, I should say that the title of the paper was something like dynamical heterogeneous is close to jamming. And of course, that's wrong. But at that time, uh, the word jamming was not well used. Uh, so this is really close to a glassy dynamics. OK? The, the, um, the boundary effect of that field is strong. Well, yes, so OK. I should precise that this picture here is taken in the center of this big. Uh, okay. uh, so the system is always, and this will be true in all the, the images, even in the other experimental system I will show you. The system has actually one more size, more square here, one more here, one on top. It's usually one tenth of the full system. And if you look at the, sh the, the let's say, the shape of the shear during the cycle, what you see is that here, OK, it's an homogeneous shear, and that's it. Whereas in the other one, is very different. No, it's actually quite clean. Okay. But you have a layer of five grains that are concerned by the, by the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then the system is homogeneous. So here, it's really homogeneous. Well, except it's, the dynamics is heterogeneous, but not because of the boundaries. OK, so let me introduce now. OK, so here I have average over all the particles and the initial time. But now I can also look at this quantity here without averaging over time. So really looking at the fluctuations of this quantity. So this is this plot. So I can do it at different time scales. OK? So this is this plot. And this is why this, I'm OK. So when it's close to 1, you see it fluctuates rather to the to downward. So these fluctuations, you can see, are not Gaussian, not trivial fluctuation. That is when it's close to 0. And when it's close to 0 0.5, you can have really very large fluctuations of this object, which is the average over all the particles of this uh, overlap function. OK? So, well, you can compute the variance in time of the signal. And now, I mean, this is exactly what Ludovic has introduced, calling it the dynamical susceptibility, and you understand why. This is, this is really our order parameter. And so it fluctuates in time. And when you look at the fluctuations of the order parameter in time, you compute the susceptibility. You would do the same thing for magnetization, actually, except that the quantity is already a dynamical one. Hence, this name four point correlation functions. So, you went to three point. What are the two curves? OK. So, this function here depends on a lag time yes. and a, a length scale. Okay. OK, for the moment, forget about the length scale. I fix it. Uh, and this is plot as a function of the lag time tau. Mm -hmm. OK, and then I will take three lag time. This is average over the time, but I can also look at the signal in time of this quantity here. And so these are these fluctuations. It's basically a spatial temporal correlation. Indeed. And it does both at the same time. 
Okay, it's clear for everybody. It's really the, the thing, the kind of things that were introduced, except our average in time replaces the ensemble average that we would do for an equilibrium dynamics. Okay, so this dynamical susceptibility will just be the variance of these curves. And it depends indeed on the time scale that you select and the length scale. There was a question about this during uh, Ludovic's uh, presentation of these quantities. How do you choose your length scale on your time scale? The answer was the length scale. You take one over the, first, uh, the position of the first peak of the static structure factor and things like this. Well, here we don't select anything. And we will explore this quantity as a function of all possible length scale and time scale. And when you do this, you obtain this kind of plot. So this is how much your order parameter is fluctuating as a function of your selection of length scale and time scale. And you see that there is a maximum somewhere. So that's interesting because you didn't select the length scale. The system tells you my dynamic is maximally heterogeneous if I look at displacement on this time scale tau star, displacements which are of the order of this A star. Okay, And when you look at the values of this, you find that A star is of the order of, let's say, typically one-fourth of a particle diameter. And OK, the associated time scale is when you go from the subdiffusive to the diffusive regime. OK? So that's really looking at these, well, average quantities. This is, these are the kinds of quantities that you look at when you study glasses. Here we have access to the real space dynamics. And so we we'll try to make a link between what we see in the real space dynamics and what these quantities, these statistical quantities, tell us. OK. So we look at the trajectories. And when we look at the trajectories of these grains, what we see, let's look in 2D. Well, what we see is that the grains, this is one grain moving. The grain is typically trapped in one region. And then from time to time, move to another region and another region, et cetera. This is the size of the grain, okay, so it's small displacements, typically of the order of one fourth of a diameter. Uh, so that's the, the scale of this A star that we that we just observed. And okay, you go from one cage, so these are the so-called cage, and these are the cage jumps. So then, of course, it's, of course, you don't, you should not take these images of cages too seriously. But really, the particles are trapped for a while in in the place, and then they move. Maybe not because of a big jump, but because of several correlated jumps and then arrive at another position, very nearby position. Okay? So we, des we designed an algorithm to identify these moments. It's not such an easy task because these moments are not large jump as compared to the others. Although remember that the distribution of the displacement were telling you that there are large displacement and small ones. Uh, okay, so we could design an algorithm to separate these case jumps. And so then the dynamics for one particle can be highly simplified between vibrational motion around the position, then some correlated moves to another position, vibrational motion, some correlated moves to another position, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. OK, and we will replace the analysis of all the dynamics from now on by just remembering for each particle when does it jump. If you do this, this is, again, the curve that I showed you before. So this is the fluctuating uh, dynamical structure factor. That's the one we just looked at before. And if now I look at what is the relative number of particles that have not jumped between t and t plus tau, I find the blue curve. So it means that if I replace the dynamics, the complete dynamics of the trajectories, by just these jumps and forget about the vibrational motion, I capture what is responsible for the large variance of that I computed before. Because of course, the variance does not come from this. The variance comes from these events. OK? So I mean, this is a very highly compression rate uh, procedure, because there are much, much less jumps than tiny fluctuations. OK. So now that we have replaced this, dy this complicated dynamics by just these jumps, we can look at where are these jumps in time and space. So this is a plot. This is space. But it's projected space so that you can look at it. It's 1D. I will show you. And this is time. 
And now you look at where are the jumps. So these are jumps for different particles. And then you can see that these jumps indeed are clustered. I mean, jumps are not randomly distributed in space and time. They are clustered. Uh, you can even, let's say, take this. You see that it doesn't last so long, these clusters. These clusters are not the dynamical heterogeneities, which were developing on time scale of the order of 700. Here, this is typically 10 cycles. And in 10 cycles, all these particles have jumped. And if you look at what has happened really in the system, well, this is the, this non-affine displacement that I was discussing at the beginning. So these particles made a collective rearrangement uh, in a time scale that is pretty short, in 10 cycles. OK? And you see also that it's not such a big region. So this is really a kind to this cooperative rearranging region uh, Ludovic was talking about. At least this is the way I see it. But again, it's important to realize that actually it's a short time dynamics. It's really you have these particles are blocked, and okay, they, 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 you shear them uh, in this uh, stroboscopic way, and okay, they would like to move, and they, they, they arrange a little bit at each cycle, and then at some point, something unblocked, and you can rearrange maybe, I don't know, 20 of them. And that's it. And then nothing happens for a while, and then you have another rearrangement like this. OK, now you may say, well, but these are not the dynamical heterogeneities. This is short time. So why are the dynamical heterogeneities that I was seeing on time scale that are much larger? So it means there must be correlations between these things. They are not independent events, although it looks like. So what we did, we considered these, these objects here. And we compare. So you can think of these objects. OK, you have these clusters of particles. They are distributed both in time and space. You can define neighbors in the time plus space, 3D space. And then you may wonder what is the distance between these objects in this space. And when you do that and you look at the statistics of this distance, they are not exponential. So let me just finish this, and I come back to your question. So this is, this green line here is the uh, Poisson distribution or the exponential uh, distribution that you obtain when you reshuffle completely randomly these events in space, I mean, these grouped events. And this is the distribution that you observe when you take the real data. And what you see is that there is an excess of short delay between the events and an excess, because you have to read, this is the cumulative distribution, so you have to read it the other way around up here, an excess of the long distance. So these events are indeed correlated in time. And then if you group the events that are in this range, that is the one that are shorter in time, closer in time than what they would be if they were purely random, and you look at them in space, what you see is, well, first, you should notice that the intersection here is precisely of the order of this time scale for the dynamical heterogeneities. And then when you plot them, you recover the the dynamical heterogeneities that you were obtaining from the analysis that I presented at the beginning. That is, this is a region that has moved, and these are regions that have not moved, and this is this region here. Or you also have this one here, which is this region here. So we understand that these dynamical heterogeneities, let me just summarize this, is the compositions of very short time scale k-jumps, which have to be clustered because you cannot jump alone. So these are I mean, trivial cooperativity. But then these clusters somehow are correlated, so you can call this facilitation, if you like, to produce the long time dynamical heterogeneities. That's the end of this first story. So there was a question by. Uh, Just understand that the, the times. Uh, you do one cycle every p equal one. Yes. So between the, the first cluster and the second cluster, you cycle 50 times. Yes, typically, yes. Just understand how much yeah, yeah, yeah. it takes to have an uh, uh, Exactly. So, so here, here, instead of looking at the cumulative distribution, we plot the, di the distribution itself. And so you see there is a short time exponential distribution and a long time one. And the short time one is indeed the, the time that separates the closest neighbors. And then the short time one is the one that separates this agglomerated set of clusters. Other questions?
Is it clear for you the relation with what Ludovic described before, or it's a complete uh, orthogonal? <laughs> Not try to make you smaller. <laughs> yes, it's okay. Don't hesitate to ask questions. I mean, some, there will be a question and answer session, but still, you can interrupt. Okay, so if it's clear. Okay, so we have now this scenario. Uh, but as I said, this experiment was a bit poor because I cannot tune any parameter, or essentially not in, really not on large ranges. Cannot increase the packing fraction. If I decrease it, the dynamics become less and less interesting. Uh, so, okay. So it happens that at that time, uh, Dr. Dorian, so Andrea's husband, was also doing experiments with particles uh, in the dance regime. And so this is a fluidized uh, air bed, and you had beads on this. It's a 2D experiment. You blow the air, and then the particles move. Ah, I forgot to say all these particles are by dispersed so that you don't form crystals. But I think that was clear for everybody that I was not talking about crystals. Mm -hmm. OK. And he was kind enough to send us all his trajectories so that we can reproduce exactly the same analysis. And there you can tune the packing fraction. And when you do this, you obtain this kind of picture. So you see some years took place, so now you have 3D plots. Just understand the setup. These particles are flying? No, 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 they are not flying. You, you just have a, an air that allows them to roll on a grid. As a matter of fact, on the short, very, very short time dynamics, you can see the pattern of the grid. Uh, and then, of course, you forget it. And then you are more or less, again, glassy. And then at long time, you are diffusive. I mean, the analysis of the mean square displacements, etc., produce really the same kind of thing as well, what I just showed you. And I will just concentrate on the, the final. The gradient between where you inject the air and where No, 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 because the air is injected everywhere. So you must think as a 2D system, the air is just a way to vibrate. Okay, you use the turbulence of the air to, to provide some kinetic energy to the grains. And when you do this, for three different packing fraction, this is what you see. So here I even do not separate in cluster, etc. I just show you the, the, the cage jumps. Uh, is that at low packing fraction, well, the dynamics is already heterogeneous, but you cannot really distinguish a uh, period of time where nothing happens, in the, I mean, massively nothing, and then really things happen. It's like some kind of a continuous heterogeneous dynamics. Then there is these regimes where these things become more isolated. That, so indeed, here there would be this time scale between the correlated move, the correlated clusters, and then long time scale when nothing happens. Okay, I should say that here, the relaxation time of the system is typically 1,000. So we rescale everything always. The time scale is rescaled by the, the relaxation time so that uh, you can compare things. And then when you really go to larger packing fraction in this system, you see now that these avalanches of clusters that define the dynamical heterogeneities becomes themselves pretty much separated. So now how, all the question is really in this kind of system are there still correlation between this avalanche and this one, or are they completely independent? And when you think about this discussion about this kinetically constrained model, where everything is related to the fact that you have defects that allows you to move, if this is really in favor of facilitation, that's what I just said before, but then when you go deeper in the glass, well, if this becomes really independent from that, well, then this is not facilitated by this. But of course, there could be an elastic field that you don't describe, that you don't understand, etc. that makes that this guy is talking to this guy. But OK, that's, that's uh, and so this is still under uh, investigation. And when we did all this, we, co we collaborated with Peter Arwell, uh, and we looked at the same thing in a liquid now. So of course, simulations. And we reproduce exactly, again, all the same analysis of all this data. And this is the result. This is. This, fluctuation, this fluctuating dynamical structure factor that I was presenting before. These are the k-jumps in these systems. This is the pattern of the dynamical heterogeneities extracted from this analysis. And this is these avalanches, that, avalanches of clusters, of cooperative clusters, that cooperate to build up the dynamical heterogeneities. So the picture is really the same. And the numbers also, that's really amazing. That is, if you map the tau alpha of the granular system and the supercooled liquid, 
Then the tau star, which is the one where there's this maximum in chi 4, the length scale, the R star, the, 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 the long time scale between this cooperative cluster or the short one are really of the same orders. So it tells us, okay, that's, although it's grains, there is friction, etc., etc., it's a good model to, to, to study this kind of complicated dynamics. At that time, we tried to study this at lower temperature and we could not. I mean, the system needs to be quite large, etc. And just for information, this is still a really a running project with Andrea, Giulio, Dave Reichman. There is a postdoc trying to reconsider these things, but now explore a vast range of temperature and see if when you decrease the temperature, again, you have something like this that happens or not. So does facilitation disappear when you are really going to low, low temperature glasses? Okay? So that's, I think, the end of the first part. How well do I do with time? That's already one hour. It's already one hour? Yeah. No, no, so no, 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 it's 37 minutes. 37 minutes. So you have a little bit less than one hour. Yes, a little bit less than one hour. Okay. Questions? Yes. I didn't know much at the time about the energy of shear. We know a bit more now. So the analogy between the temperature and the granular system for those experiments, I think it's a kind of value. Yes. But now the analogy with your cyclic experiments, I, I don't see it anymore. Because the, the way we understand now the cyclic shear experiment is that uh, there will be a critical angle below which you have no, I agree. and above which you have uh, essentially yielding happening all the time. I, no, I'm... So the driving itself, it seems to me... Yeah, yeah, it's very weird. It's very weird. I, uh, today, I no, 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 it's very weird, but I would not... Uh, talk about it in terms of yielding because at the packing fraction we consider there. But you can do the periodic sharing of the expansions at any density below jamming. Yes. The transition between the flowing and the flowing is. Uh, but below jamming for hard spheres would be a liquid, right? Without yeah, agitation. Without the so the, yes. the cyclic shear is giving you the plastic events that reorganize everything. And that's why I don't see any No, no, but I agree with this. With I have the same summer. feeling today. That I wanted to present it to, to yeah. really make the history, but I agree. Yeah, I, I but wrote it just like you at the time. The dynamic, hmm? I mean, at the time, I had not thought No, 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 but uh, so, the, so the dynamics is very weird in the first system. I completely agree. So, but we know also that we cannot go to higher, I mean, to higher angles, and maybe then we even shear jam the system. I mean, it's really unclear than what we do. I, I completely agree. Uh, so, indeed, today it would be nice to redo a vibrated experiment uh, like, the other one. Uh, like the other one, but the other one, as you will see, has another drawback. <laughs> okay, let's come to the other one. Uh, but I know today how to do one that would not have that drawback, and okay, but probably if I was redoing this, you would say, ah, but you did this 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> not you, not you. <laughs> the community. <laughs> Andrea. Actually, if you did this shearing in the yellow region, you might see the memory effects, right? You might see uh, the yes, then there are all these things also that came uh, into uh, into play. Um, yes, maybe. You, you never saw no, anything? Like no, no, that. and this experiment does not exist anymore, so... Uh, <laughs> any other question? Yes, Kenny. You? So, you're, when you're shearing, you have constant volume? Yes. So, in this diagram, where are you? Somewhere, uh, I don't know. So temperature is the, you set it by the interaction between the particles? But I know, I mean, they are hard. So, I mean, in this diagram, the only thing I can say is that I am at a given packing fraction. I mm -hmm. provide some energy to the system so that it can explore configuration. I mean, we could see it more like, uh, okay, I will uh, a little bit may jump, but like a Monte Carlo dynamics. That is, you, you explore configurations uh, obviously, you don't explore all of them, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, clearly we are on this side, huh? for sure we are on this side, and there is some packing fraction here, and uh, I managed to explore configurations at low temperature, uh, well, here. That's, that's all what I would say. But the dynamics is unclear, I fully agree with this. Other questions? 
Yes, no, no, but see it, see it low. I think it's very no, okay. It, it's shearing that provides the energy that's provided. Yes, okay. and it's cyclic shear. It's quasi-static cyclic okay. shear. So it's really, let's try to go somewhere, come back. Ah, we don't come back exactly at the same place. This is a new configuration. Okay. And then let's take another new configuration, etc., etc. No? Okay, so let's, let's move to the second part, where the dynamics will be clearer. So, because of these, indeed, limits, and in also uh, in terms of interpretation of this first experiment, we wanted to set up another one. Uh, now, it happens that in the other one, we could, not, we could not study the glass, and we'll tell you why in a minute. Okay, so the other experiment is, again, we have these, these grains. At that time, they were metallic grains. It's a much heavier experiment. You have these grains, they are on a plate, they are on a glass plate. And now you shake them by shaking the glass plates. So you really use friction between the grains and the glass plates to inject energy into the grains. You don't shake from the boundary. You shake from the bottom. Okay? And of course, if you don't want your grains to end up everywhere in the lab, you have to confine them. So you confine them with a wall. The wall is attached to the lab, and it's not shaken. So it means you essentially inject energy in the bulk. You will dissipate energy uh, at the walls, mostly, also uh, with the bottom. And then there is one of the wall where we can tune the packing fraction and measure the, the mechanical pressure or the mechanical forces. So this system, because we can compact it, we can vary the packing fraction. Uh, again, it's by dispersed. Again, there are typically 10,000 grains. Ah, yes, and I should say, again, we, we shake the grains periodically. But that's, I mean, that's not a very good excitation. You will agree with me. So we shake the grains periodically, but we will take picture in phase with this oscillation. So again, it's the idea. So now it's not quasi static anymore. I think it's, yes, 10 hertz. Um, but we shake the grains, and we take picture each time the plate is at the same place. And again, so you inject energy in this system, and it will explore configuration. But now it's more like a, really a vibration. Uh, OK, so the first thing is, how do you prepare your system now? It's not at a given packing fraction only. And so this is, OK, I start from a loose packing fraction, and I compress the system. And here, in this, just in this picture, I compress it step by step. So this is the packing fractions I'm aiming at. And this is the response of the systems in terms of pressure. So the pressure is very low. It's not zero because I'm shaking, so there are collisions with the walls. But then I make a step in packing fraction, boom, the pressure increase, and then relaxes towards a lower pressure. And then I compress again, relaxes, and you can see that the relaxation is slower and slower. So that's really the same as if you were taking, uh, I mean, uh, a hard sphere liquid, and then you, you increase a little bit the packing fraction, the pressure jumps, and then relaxes slowly. And the denser you are, the slower is the relaxation. So this is two hours and a half, and this is 15 minutes probably. And at some point, you are really fed up of waiting. But also, the pressure becomes really serious, and we don't want to break uh, everything. It's the problem, and studying jamming in experiments, the problem is you go from zero to infinite pressure in a very, very small uh, variation of packing fraction. Um, now, what is interesting is that then when you are there, so it's a very slow dynamics. You have made it as slow as possible. And then in the next experiment, we actually do this compression not step by step, but with a logarithmic protocol. Again, a few hours. Um, and then when you decompress step by step, well, then you don't really see this kind of relaxation in this region. And you can convince yourself of this even better by making here not only downward step, but downward and upward step. And when you do this, you come back exactly at the same value of the, of the pressure. So on these time scales, which are much shorter than this one, well, much shorter, shorter than these ones, you don't see any aging phenomena in the pressure that you measure. That's more or less also related to something uh, Ludovic said a few days ago. OK, so you can measure the pressure while you vibrate, but you can also switch off the vibration. That's very easy. You just switch off the engine. And then you can measure the pressure that is still there or not. And the blue and red points correspond to these two measurements. And you see that for large packing fraction, they are superimposed. And then at some point, the pressure that you measure when you switch off the vibration is essentially zero, with error bars because there is friction amongst these grains. 
well, it's not error bars, it's fluctuations because of the friction. And then the pressure that you measure in the presence of vibration reaches a plateau. So here you can understand this part of the pressure as being really the contribution of the kinetics uh, of the vibration. And this part here is the pressure that you would have at zero temperature. And so we interpret this transition really as a transition where the grains can collide or not and are jammed. So somewhere here, around here, must be the jamming transition of this system. Okay, so now we are not talking anymore about really the glassy dynamics. We prepare the system in a glass, and then by tuning the packing fraction, note the range of variation of the packing fraction here. We tune it between 0 0.84, 0 0.845. It's a very tiny range where the pressure takes one order of magnitude. Okay, um, yes? You prefer the way of, so uh, it's a technical aspect that, uh, of doing this way instead of changing the pressure on the side and checking how the density increases with time. Yes, at that time we were really, I mean, it was easier to tune the packing fraction because you just have this wall, you move it, you know. You have a control of, of this wall, on this wall you have a control that is very, very high. Because, I mean, you can control the position of a, of a mechanical wall by, I don't know, a, a tenth of a millimeter or even lower than that on a cell that is uh, something like 50 centimeters. So you can tune your packing fraction very, very precisely. The pressure would be a measure with fluctuations. And so that's not, although from the conceptual point of view, we would like also to control the pressure. And in this way, you're putting the system continuously out of the equilibrium. Yes. And you wait. Uh, exactly. So you do yes. something on one side, and then you have to wait that what you did, the propagate inside the system and the pressure reaches the... Yes, but that's where the injection from the, from the bottom... I, I mean, the fact that the energy is injected everywhere and not only at the wall helps a lot. Yes. This is a sort of memory, right? I mean... Where? What, what is this? I'm sorry, the bottom left. Here? The yes. You have to wait to age. Yes. I guess the displacements are in shorter and shorter scales, but they don't affect what you were doing at uh, slower, smaller pressures. So that when you come back, you don't age. I mean, how do you enter? You made the link to the but I don't know what uh, you were talking about. I just say that if you, okay, here you can imagine that you are following your the equation of state of your, of your liquid, right? Mm -hmm. So you increase the packing fraction in your equation of state, the pressure shoots up because you do it in an, I mean, too fast as with respect to the equilibration time of the system and it relaxes. But then this relaxation time takes longer and longer. And if you do it for very long, but then once you are there, you study the response of the system to a variation in packing fraction on short times, much shorter than the time scales you equilibrated it, you don't see the aging of the system on this time scale. That's what I was referring to. They, they, they come to the same... I mean, the plateau, is From the there plateau? to there? No, I mean, if you take the first step and the last step, it's the same packing fraction, it's here? the same pressure. But that's what you have here? More or less, not really, but... Okay, okay. We can discuss this yeah, uh, okay. again. Okay, the protocol is clear? Okay, so now... So this is really, OK, close to, to the jamming. If, if we wanted to study the glass, we would have to study it at lower packing fraction. And the problem is that in this system, this kind of forcing, experimentally, this is something that uh, often happens when you play with granular media that you shake, you observe large scale convection. And it's very hard to kill it. So that's why uh, this system that was initially built to make the, the same study as before at lower packing fraction, where you can tune the packing fraction to study the glass, didn't work, and fortunately, we could study the gem. Okay, that's the life of an experimentalist. Uh, okay, so the glass. This thing is a glass. So this is the Voronoi tessellation, so the neighbors, and it's colored by this overlap that I was talking about before. So one means you have not changed neighbors at all. Zero would mean you have changed neighbor, and this is on the total duration of the experiment in this regime. The experiment starts when you have prepared the glass, and then you, you look at this. And so it means the system never changed neighbors. Essentially not. So it's, it's really the structure is frozen. OK. Still, you look at the trajectories, and well, it's not stupid trajectories in a cage. 
The trajectories are again quite complicated. So this is at the loosest packing fraction I will look here. This is at the densest one. So the trajectories are not just vibrations. They are more complicated than that. But now this is the size of the grain. So this is super, super tiny move. But these tiny moves are not trivial. And then you can reproduce the analysis. Say, Let's just do the same as before, but without specifying this length scale A, this time scale, this time scale two, and let's see what will the dynamical uh, variance tells us. And uh, when you do this, you find this plot. So again, you have a maximum, but now this maximum is as a length scale that is, well, 10 to the minus two particle diameter. We are talking of very, very, very small motion. But these very small motions are heterogeneous. And they are heterogeneous on super long length scale. We are not talking at all about the chi form that is three particle diameter here. This is something like 20 particles or 15 particles diameter. It's large streams of motion that are super, super small. <coughs> okay? And this is, now this time, again, it's a few years later. So instead of just computing the variance, you can compute the full uh, five four correlator, look at the scaling property, and this is the scaling of the correlator that allows you to measure this, this length scale chi four. Yes, Francesco. I'm totally confused. The, the blue trajectory is what? So the blue trajectory is the trajectory. Come on. Is the trajectory some, somewhere in this? So the packing fraction has been decreased already quite a lot. It's by one particle diameter. No, no, no. 0.4 particle diameter altogether on the 10,000 cycles of the experiment. This one. So indeed, and when you are, and when you are here, then it moves by 0 0.1 particle diameter on the total duration. Yeah, so this one probably would a little bit. So, okay, this plot here was probably not including the very, very loose, very loose case. But really, you would have a few that would, that would change neighbors then. Okay, the point is really that when we study here, you don't have change of neighbors. Yeah, the blue one is a bit extreme, probably. Okay. So that's, that's, that's a bit puzzling. This should puzzle you. We are very close to jamming. Essentially, everything is frozen, but there is a very, very short length dynamics that is not trivial and that is also heterogeneous. Okay, but it's of course not the same heterogeneity as the one we were just discussing during the first half an hour. So the correlation function is exponential in the square root of R of xi. Yes. I mean, so that's the scaling form, but I don't know. You know. Uh, okay. Okay, then we say, okay, but so since these displacements are so small, it must be these little gaps between the particles that open and close, because that's the typical distance that you would have among these particles at this packing fraction. And so it would be better to have a system where we can really see not only the gaps when they are open, but also when they are close. And so we'll take a system of particles that's a little bit softer, that is made of these photoelastic uh, disks. I introduced by Bob Beringer that I showed you at the beginning, and we will do exactly the same experiment. But now, because there are <laughs> photoelastics, we can really count the contacts. We can look at the contacts between the particles, so we don't have only access to the little gaps between the particles. So these are the gaps, these are the particles. We also have access to the contacts and the intensity of the force, or at least the range, whether the force is, strength, is, is strong or not, between the particles. If you compute the average number of contacts below a certain packing fraction, you always see contact because we have a finite time resolution. So I mean, uh, these, these things, even if they open, it, because of the dynamics, it takes time. So we have a finite amount of contact. But then what is important is that at some point, it really starts to increase. So you have permanent contacts that really form. OK, so that's we identify this with some kind of souvenir of the jamming transition that should be there if there was no vibration. Because remember, we are vibrating permanently. So we are not at the strictly zero temperature problem. 
Ok. Ah. I will have to. I have masked the, the, the slides, but I. So if you now ask me to reintroduce the slides that I've suppressed not to be too long. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, so then we can say, okay, let's forget about these displacements that are so tiny. Let's concentrate on the contacts. And so we'll introduce an overlap function that is defined with the contact. That is, I say that if a particle lose uh, less than one contact, it remains one, and if it loses more than one contact, it becomes zero. Of course, you can make it with one or two. It doesn't change anything to the story. And we can look at the dynamical contact structure factor. And what you see is that it has a transition between a regime where it's completely frozen and a regime where, I mean, it decorrelates slowly, but it decorrelates. So there is a transition somewhere here in packing fraction. Now, the epsilon is the distance in packing fraction from this one. And you can look at this, and well, this is the, so, okay, so zero is where the number of contacts starts increasing. And you can look at the relaxation time of this stretch uh, exponential, and you see that, well, this grow by a factor of two decades when you approach the jamming transition. So there is a dynamics that becomes slower and slower when you approach, should not call this a jamming transition, the, the, the memory in the contact of what would be the jamming transition at zero vibration, okay? So that's, at that time, I remember we, that was at the end of the thesis of Corentin Coulet, and we discussed with Francesco, and we said, okay, it's, it's amazing. It's a little bit like if we had like a spin glass transition of the contact within this glass, or something like this. And at that time, we were not talking yet about Garner and uh, these kind of things. Okay. Um, and we can, of course, look again at the dynamical heterogeneities of this contact dynamics. And this is plotted here as a function of the packing fraction, and it has a peak. Although the peak is not at zero. It's a little bit before. Okay, that's an experimental fact. By curiosity, we also look at the one that, you, that we computed before with the positions of the particle, so that's the real dynamics of the particle as this minute scale, so A is uh, 10 to the minus 2. And it has also a peak, and the two correlates really well. So that tells you that indeed these dynamics heterogeneities that we have picked up with this uh, dynamical function for the position, for the, for the dynamics, is really the same, I mean, really takes its origin of these heterogeneous dynamics of, of the contact or the closing of the gap. I mean, that's, that's the same. Um, okay, so that's the summary of what I just said. We have this transition in the contact number, average contact number, and we have this transition in the dynamics, and both peak somewhere before the moment where the contacts really become, I mean, really start to increase. And so there is some kind of question. Here we have this average number of contacts that start to grow in a similar way as the way they would grow at the zero temperature or zero vibration uh, limit. And we have a dynamical signature of something at a packing fraction a little bit lower. Okay, that's the experimental results. Now, to answer Federico, I need to unmask a slide somewhere. Let's see. Where is it? Somewhere. It's here. Just to answer this question. Okay. This is decreasing the vibration. This peak that I showed you increases, becomes larger, and goes towards this point. Okay, we describe it with these laws, but I mean, look at the data. I mean, it's, it's really tough to go to this, this point of analysis, and so you should not take too seriously uh, uh, this, this, uh, I mean, these are the experimental observations. Okay, so the lower the temperature, the more critical things seem to be and closer to the zero temperature jamming point. That's all what I can say. OK, let's uh, go back. How much time, Julio? <laughs> How much? 30 minutes. Good. OK, so let's come back to what we know today about these, uh, these systems, or these systems. Broader systems. I mean, these are equilibrium physics. I'm talking about grains, but okay, that's the best we can do. 
So you heard about this, uh, okay, the equilibrium liquid curve, pressure over, uh, so in mean field, uh, the state following procedure uh, that uh, Francesco described, and then uh, there were problems here with the stability of these, uh, of these curves. And then he told you, well, it happens that if instead of just looking at the one step replica breaking, you look at uh, the, the fuller RSB scheme, you can actually show that there is another transition here that takes place between this table glass and what is called the marginal glass, which is much more complicated. Okay, but which means that, if this is true, that the jamming, the jam states are always in this marginal glass. They are not in a simple glass. This mean field picture has been confirmed by looking at simulations in three dimensions. And these are all the papers uh, about this. Uh, and so this transition is called the Garner transition. It's well known in uh, spin glasses. Um, and so it makes this separation between this table glass and this marginal glass. So what is meant by this? Let's try to... So here, uh, maybe I, uh, I spoil a little bit, uh, maybe Francesco will say a few more words about that, or maybe because I do it, he will not need to do it. Uh, but the idea is that, okay, when you are in the liquid, you can explore the full phase space, and then when you are in the normal glass, well, you can explore these glass states or these glass basins, Again, in finite dimension, uh, you all know that all this is ill-defined, but this is the mean film picture. Uh, and now, the idea is that, okay, so that's the one-step uh, replica symmetry breaking uh, picture, but, well, it happens that there is this second transition where each glass splits in many, many marginal glasses. Okay, like suddenly, instead of having just one simple basin, inside this basin, you have many basins, a little bit this naive picture here. So when you look at the mean square displacement, when you are in a liquid, you are diffusive. When you are in a glass, we all learned during this week that, okay, you don't move. The mean square displacement is, is a plateau because you cannot explore further than this region in phase space. And then here, it's a bit complicated. You are somewhere in uh, one of these little minima here. And then when you start exploring, and this defines some length scale, but then if you wait long enough because these things it's really an, an infinite hierarchy of, uh, of little minima. Well, you can always find one not so far. And so at some point, you will move to another one, etc., etc. And so you will have a bizarre aging mean square displacement of this kind. OK. So we are interested in but what does it mean in, in real space? I mean, can we, can we try to, to measure things about this? Uh, OK. So let's look again at this picture. Um, so we imagine that we have this, uh, this free energy landscape. Again, I mean, this is really uh, hand wavy because the, the, the true system will not be mean field and these barriers are not infinite. We discussed this so many times, but anyhow. And the idea is that, okay, here, we can, we can think of it precisely in terms of these neighboring particles. Okay, it's really a real space picture of an infinite dimension mean field phase space picture. So I mean, there's a gap. Uh, at, uh, at least uh, at least one gap. There are two infinity gaps there, but anyhow. Uh, the idea is that when you compress your system, you enter the glass, and when you are in the glass, the structure is frozen. So if the structure is frozen, it means you cannot change your neighbors. But there's plenty of room in the glass. Well, plenty of room. That is, you can still collide with all your neighbors. Okay? And then you compress a little bit further. At jamming, you will be in contact in two dimensions with precisely four neighbors. But you have typically six neighbors. So how do you select the four, the four neighbors you will be in contact with? This must happen at some point. And this must happen for each grain. So now within the configuration, this makes a lot of many combinations of possible jam state for one glass state. Because the glass state is defined by the neighbors that you cannot escape. But the jam state are defined by the contact that you will form. OK, so you can imagine that this guy here has six neighbors, but in one case, I compressed it. I selected these four neighbors to form contacts, and then I decompressed a little bit. Bigono? Ah, oui, oui, on arrive dans une demi-heure. OK, stop. I'll just stop this. OK, so. Um, 
So I decompress it a little bit, and I recompress, and ah, it has not selected the same four neighbors. So this is the image, the real space image I have of this, um, this free energy on this, uh, this energy landscape, where the things become at some point you select the glass, but once you have selected the glass, you have not selected the jam configurations. There are plenty of them behind. And this happens not like in a complicated crossover, but in the mean field picture, it happens through a well-defined transition, which is the Garner transition. So what can you measure to see if this is present or not in the system? Of course, in this 2D system, it will not be a true transition, but can there be some measure that indicates this? And these measures were proposed in, this, uh, in these numerical papers here, and we try to follow them. Uh, and the idea is the following. The idea is exactly this. I will compress, prepare my system in a glass, and these things are vibrating. And then I will compress further. And of course, if I compress further, well, the plateau of the mean square displacement gets smaller, because the cage gets narrower. So this is this delta. But then I decompress again, and I come back. And I will come back, and I will select other contacts. But I don't compress up to the contact. I let them vibrate. So that it, the contact now means the one I hit more frequently. And so it means that once, so this is a given packing fraction, this gray, I don't know if everybody sees, but so this gray thing here is a given packing fraction, a little bit loose. I compress, and I observe this. OK, this is, if I measure this, this is the size of these cages, or the size, the height of the mean square displacement. Then I decompress to the same initial packing fraction value. I will again explore this gray stuff. Then I compress again. So I'm still in the same glass reference, the Y that was introduced by Francesco. But I recompressed, and now I may compress around a slightly different configuration, because I will not select the same contact if I were compressing to jamming. And so now I can, in principle, measure now the distance between these clouds. So if the, 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 this energy landscape picture is simple, then there is no reason why I would stay there. I would just do a cage that is smaller, but center around this, in, the, in this gray uh, large, large cage. And this distance here would be the same as this one. OK, I will always explore all the space that I have. This suggests I really have smaller basins, but it's a translation in the real space. OK, so when I do, when they do this in simulation, this is what they see. This is as a function of the packing fraction. This is at loose packing fraction. You increase the packing fraction. The red dot here is the size of the equilibrated cage as a function of the packing fraction. This is the the somehow stupid decreasing function. And then the delta AB is the distance between the cages that you explore if you, if you do several explorations starting always from the same glass and compressing. And of course, in, in simulations, you can do this with ensemble statistics. And these are the green dots here. And so you see that indeed, at some point, these two separate. That is, this one saturates at the size of the, this gray cage, and uh, the other one keeps going down. And this was the mean field picture, and this is in 3D hard spheres, where again, you see the plateau decreasing, but this distance between this replica is saturating here. So can we do this in the grains? I will not tell you all this if we had not uh, succeeded in observing it. So this is the protocol. We compress the system. We prepare it super, super glassy, uh, super even over jammed, because they are a little bit soft. And then we go back to some packing fraction. The difficulty of the experiment is not to go back too far. Otherwise, you, go, you melt your glass, and the experiment is over. You have to run it again, because you don't want to leave your glass that you so difficultly prepared. And then you compress to some packing fraction. You decompress, and you do this 10 times. And you vary the target packing fraction. Is it clear for everybody what I'm doing? Yes? OK, so you do this. You compute, essentially, the quantities that were introduced by Francesco, which are aiming at computing this delta and this delta AB. You have to be careful with the time scales and so forth and so on. Um, and when we do this, this is what we observe. So this is 
uh, these are the time series of this delta AB and delta, and these are the averages. And so this is the size of the plateau. And you see that, OK, it decreases as expected, as expected with the packing fraction. And this is this distance between these cages that I explore at each cycle. And so indeed, again, you see that there is a gap here, and that these two separate. So that's an indication that some of the physics described in these equilibrium liquids, uh, or I mean, in these in this, uh, deeply uh, cooled glasses, is present in this system. The phi that you write is the final one? Yes, it's the final one. So larger phi also have a larger delta phi, because you start always from phi zero. Yes, yes, that's right. Can you do the same experiment with the fixed delta phi? So you compress by the same amount. Yes, I can, but then it's harder to interpret. Because I would like to start always, I, I mean, look at, look at this picture. I want to know my starting point. I don't want to change it. I want to always explore this cage. So that's, if you want, this is, no. Uh, this, no, no, that was the right direction. OK, I want to, to set the height of the g global basin that I explore. That's my phi naught. And then I want to go down at a, another phi and see what happens to me. And then I go down to uh, another phi, etc., etc. But I want to set the size of the largest basin that I explore. I mean, if otherwise, if I change also this one, well, you, you can do this, and probably you can get things from that. But I'm not sure if it would be very easy to, to analyze, I mean, to, to interpret. For any phi which is beyond what you call phi capital G, mm -hmm. the two should be different. Yes. Uh, the problem is, is that when you change phi by a lot, uh, you are doing something which is more non-equilibrium. So. Nah. Do you see any sign of aging in the dynamics here? No, but it's, it's like when you do a meaning equation. These are two different protocols. They yes, but you so you go to stationary states, which are different. Yes. So you don't see the non-equilibrium in the fact that you're no. stationary. The non-equilibrium is, is in the protocol to reach the stationary states. Yes. So I would be happier with the same physics is seen by doing jumps of a fixed delta phi. Yes. Or, so yeah, yeah, I understand. Why not the phi are, are changed? I don't know. Uh, has it been looked at in... Uh, in the numerics, this, uh, this is there is a difference between the two. I think if you look at the aging of the uh, of the delta AB, you may see a difference. But if you just here we look really at a time scale such that we don't see aging in this uh, in this quantity. And so I think okay, but we can. I mean, that's the aim of the aim of this is to detect the transition when they separate. You are not recording inside the glass. Then what happens after they separate and leave is not the way you do it. The separation of the things to be more or less. So you, if you choose 5 not uh, up to point 82, the same picture should apply. Yes, but I think the problem is that the fact would be much smaller because if you do small jumps, you will not see them, then it's fair noise and uh, not in, in detail. I will keep the jump size constant. Because I know that that effect it depends a lot on the jump size. Right? So I, I, will, I would like to say that, that the, the reason why you don't see below 8.82 is not because the jump is too small. Right? It's because there is really no difference between the two deltas. I don't say that I would not see it below 82 if I were not taking another phi zero. Because I would explore another basin. You know, this phi zero is okay. Is uh, I mean, sets the glass that you decide to explore. In the okay, in this uh, where is it? It, it? it tells you from where, what following state you are following. That's. That's what we said. So if I take another phi zero, I would start from here, yes. And the Gardner would not be at the same place. It would be changed. Ah, OK. Yeah. 
Yes, because it depends on where. Yeah. And that's why, okay, let's, let's conclude to this. And that means those who are, because, okay. So, okay, so there is this, this heavy, oops, ah, yes, that's the one I, I didn't want to show, and this one either. Um, <laughs> um, so, the conclusion is that, okay, there is, there is evidence that something indeed happens in this deep glass. And now, but for this, you should have had the lesson about this Garner stuff. Imagine that you have such a rough energy landscape. You can imagine that the dynamics will indeed be very complicated, that it can contain the heterogeneities. And so the question, of course, here is, is this the source of the heterogeneities at minute scale, but with very large correlation lengths that I was describing before or not? It, at the level of the experiment, it's an open question. There might be other reasons for these large scale heterogeneities. I mean, more like soft modes or things like this. And so, I mean, the relation between these things are not, I mean, established here. I just say that there is a candidate. This is a very rough energy landscape that could be responsible for these very bizarre um, dynamics. So you showed a lot of maps to show it, 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 it this displacement? Yes. So did you look at that in this case or not? No. Uh, did we look at, no, we didn't. Like no, we didn't look at that. I mean, this is uh, one of the problem we had is that with this photo with this photoelastic disk, the the, the detail tracking of the particle, I mean, of all of the particles, is much more difficult. Also, because these photoelastic disks were old, we have no new ones. We could reproduce everything and then really see if I mean these are the same experiments as these ones. Okay, let's, let's answer more precisely to this, because I mean, it's the same experiments as these ones. The one where we looked at the contact dynamics, etc. Same these, same conditions. But it's not the same experiment the same day. So, you so very the reason is that, and you are aware of this, is that when I do all this here, all these cycles, mm -hmm. I have to go at rather low, well, low, packing fraction so that I can explore a given basin before compressing to have a certain range of phi. Uh, if you look at the result, you see that this is phi naught, mm -hmm. and the transition, the Garner transition, is there. So it's very close to phi naught, right? Yeah. Which means, again, in the the Garner is very close to the phi naught, and that's because I I cannot equilibrate. I don't have swap at my disposal, so I cannot do like you. I cannot go there. Uh, I have to equilibrate around here. And so this is why the experiment is very difficult, because I prepare my glass there. I, actually, I go deeper, and then I come back. And I have this tiny range where I can see something. Uh, and because I'm in this regime, when I do all these cycles, although we pay attention to, to look at the data where it does not happen, on these 10, these 10 cycles, each cycle contains 10,000 vibrations. With 10 packing fractions, that's 100,000 vibrations. Yeah. I have aging, of course, on, this, on these time scales. And so I cannot then do the other experiment, which would consist as of exploring at each phi the dynamics to, to really map. You see what I mean? No, I think it's, uh, I don't uh, ask for that. It's just the, the delta ID you compute. You have delta EV of each particle? Yes. So the map, you have it for So the answer is not of each. In when we did the experiment, we had something like, I don't know, 50% of the particles that we could not track during all the game there. And then I have a hard time to see whether it's correlated in space or not. That's what you want to see. You want to know if there are correlations in space that corresponds to and I, I cannot answer to this. But at least you know it's not just 10 guys. Yes, this, okay. uh, yes, this I think it's not, lo it's not the localized defect of. Uh, no, I think there are enough evidences of these large collective things in this yeah. system, in this range of packing fraction, not to believe uh, the, the more explanation. But uh, to really answer definitively to this, I should have a map of these things. I agree. No, but the previous experiment was convincing. No, but I mean, still there is this little. Uh, you know. I have a stupid question. Maybe, but you say you don't have a swap at your disposal, but in principle you could. 
right? I mean, at the end, you could say the drug is cheap. What would happen? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but it's true. I mean, again, these are uh, 10 years or 12 years ago experiments. Today, I think you, you buy a micropipette robot yeah. and you design carefully the thing on top of this table, etc., etc., and you could imagine to swap particles mm -hmm. from time to time but using a polydispersed system, etc., etc. In principle, do it in this system. I think I would be able to equilibrate glasses uh, down here instead of here. And then I should be able to have, I mean, I should be able to see the, dis I mean, the evolution of my Garner transition with the initial packing fraction phi naught. That is by disperse, or am I missing something? It's by disperse, yes. So it would be super hard to do the, the, the swap with by disperse. So the first thing I would do, I would do, I would take, uh, I would re engineer my photoelastic disk according to the distribution that Ludovic likes. And he tells me this is the one where it does not crystallize, etc., etc. And then I would uh, do the swap uh, with it's my robot. Isn't it under high pressure? Hmm? Isn't it under fairly high pressure? I mean, can you just pour particle up? This, this one also, yes. So, yes, but maybe with the friction when I pull, I would have everything yeah. jumping. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes, indeed, the pressure is high. I forgot to say that for all these experiments, there's a plate on top so that we never have a uh, buckling like this. And it has happened that in the hard disk, it has happened that the pressure was so high, and that's why I said it's limited also because the jamming you go to infinite pressure, you go so high in pressure that at some point you had buckling, it pushed the glass plate of one centimeter thick, send it in the lab, all the grains, the glass plates exploded, and the PhD t t a student that comes, uh, you know, crying, ah! everything is broken. <laughs> this has happened. <laughs> Once only. <laughs> but Yes, it does happen. <laughs> the pressure is very high. Swap is risky. <laughs> <laughs> now, because I think, yes, when we would take one off, you will have <laughs> some re local rearrangement like that. OK, anyhow, so I have 10 minutes. Seven. Okay. Seven, OK. So this is, these are the conclusion first. So, so OK, <laughs> let's just uh, put the conclusion. OK, there they are. OK, so we have, on one hand, we could see that in these uh, model glass formers, uh, you look at the glassy dynamics. When you increase the packing fraction, you see slow dynamics with stretch exponential, dynamical heterogeneities. The, dy the dynamical heterogeneities are built up by the, uh, the, um, the correlations of cooperative short times uh, rearrangements. And whether these things are facilitated depending on the temperature or on the packing fractions remains an open question. In the granular experiments, we have the, 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 the feeling that when you go deeper in the, in the glass, it's less and less facilitated. That is, it's facilitated be be at the beginning, and then when you increase further the packing fraction, these avalanches separate more and more. OK, that was the first part of the talk. Then the second part, we say, OK, let's go deep in the glass, and let's study what happens when the particles really want to touch. And so when we are very close to the jamming transition, there is still dynamics. The, con the main conclusion is that the dynamics of contact, the opening and the closing of the gap that is the relevant one, that's the one that controls all the motion of the grains. And this dynamics is, again, highly heterogeneous. And a possible candidate for these large-scale heterogeneities is the fact that the phase there is marginal. That is, it's always unstable. And you have diverging length scale in all this phase. Actually, the whole phase is, is, is marginal, and the susceptibility should be infinite everywhere there. OK, so that's uh, the summary of this. Now, uh, in the f now eight minutes or six minutes that I have, we'll just flash two other sets of experiments that we did, which are more like response function. Are these materials mechanically bizarre? I mean, there are there spontaneous fluctuations that are bizarre, so you, you may expect that the response is also bizarre. So don't try to follow all the details. Uh, just flash the points, and then you can come and see me during the, the end of the week. We can discuss further if you're interested. The first thing we do, we probe elasticity. So we take, we put inside the packing a, a, a particle that you can inflate. Okay, That's a bit weird, but we can do that. So you inflate it, 
And so it happens that in a large system, if you inflate a circular particle, what you do is pure shear. This is elastic calculation, elasticity. OK, so we do this. And then we follow, we look at all the particles, and we can compute everything. The trace of the strain displacement, the trace of the stress, the deviatoric part of the strain, and the deviatoric part of the stress. So that's the shear stress. That's uh, the elongated stress, that's uh, the dilation, and that's the pressure. OK, and then you have this for all these particles at all the times and for all the size of these inflators, so a lot of data. And you can put all of them together. Let's, let's go fast. And what you recover, you can rescale those data. And what you recover from that is that these systems is actually experiencing shear softening. That is, you share it, and it becomes easier and easier. That's the first thing I wanted to flash. Uh, this is what I've plotted here. This, is, this would be the shear modulus. There's also a dilatancy softening. So you have your linear regime that we don't probe, because it's, it's too small, this linear regime. We never capture it, even when we try to inflate a little, a little bit. It's, always, it's already too much. Uh, maybe because we are very, very close to, the, to, the, to this jamming point. And then it's shear softened before saturating again to a new linear regime. That's the first statement. Uh, and that's a bit weird. It has been observed in simulation also by Zao Ayakawa. And there are other people who have looked at this. But OK, there is a, an interesting nonlinear elasticity uh, in this region. The second thing is more like yielding. So let me skip this. Um, OK, this is the experiment. This is ex exactly, again, the same experiment with this shaking grain. And now we take one grain, and we'll pull on this grain. So it's a bit like micro rheology. And uh, you pull with this grain with a constant, a constant mass. This is a movie. You will see here, those, this is the intruder. It's a bit larger than the grains around. You will see a movie if it works. I, I don't know. Um, this is the, the picture, I mean, the, the, the grains. And this is when we analyze the data. And you will see the motion of the particles here. Ah. Does it work? Oh, come on, it doesn't work. OK. OK, it doesn't matter. Uh, I can show it to you later. Uh, OK, and so what is interesting here is simply that when you study this, uh, what you see is that depending on the packing fraction, again, this tiny, tiny variation of the packing fraction between 0 0.8358, you see why I control the packing fraction rather than the pressure, and 0 0.413. This is the displacement of the intruder as a function of time. And you see, well, this one here is performing 40 grains diameter. That's for a given mass pulling on it. In, uh, this is in, uh, in, in cycle of vibration, in a few cycle of vibration. And this one, I just increased the packing fraction by 1%, <coughs> even less. And now this, in 3,000 cycles, uh, I mean, essentially has moved a one grain diameter or a few grains diameter. OK, so you can again study all this. And this allows you to define some kind of a line here where you can say that you really freedize your system by pulling on it or not. And so you can interpret this as some kind of yielding line. And then discuss this with respect to, uh, to, the, to the studies uh, about yielding, in particular uh, a paper by Ludovic where he has studied the yielding of uh, different families of soft uh, particles, soft spheres, let's say. And it depends on the packing fraction on KBT divided by, uh, by the, 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 the energy scale of the potential. And well, you see that you have different kinds of yielding curves. So this is the yielding surface in this uh, in this diagram. Uh, and you see that depending on your temperature, you can yield really at jamming, mostly at jamming. And there is a little bit of yielding at the glass. And if you're at higher temperature, you have yield at the glass transition. And then some kind of second things that happen when you get denser. And well, when we look at our, at our data for the two system that we have, the very hard disk or the softer one, well, we find two curves like this. OK, and then the question is, how far can we uh, compare this system with uh, these, these simulations? Um, OK, and then in this system, when this thing is pulled, you can study many, many things. You can study the statistics of these jumps, of these displacements, and you have all kinds of bizarre uh, fluctuations that, to date, 
have not been explored theoretically, and I think it would be very interesting, uh, because we have some kind of experimental measurements where we can say that there are avalanches of motion when you pull at constant force, and these avalanches may be related to the spontaneous fluctuation, as always. So this would be, of course, something that is also extremely interesting to, to, to study. But that's really a completely, uh, complete open field. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. Uh, if you're interested, come and see me. Uh, we can discuss all this further. Here is a list of papers you can have a look at. Uh, and thank you for, for your attention and your questions. Can also have questions with the tip -ons. Yeah. Or going there, but yeah. Um, so I don't know if it's relevant, but during the second part of the talk, so you had vibrated grains. So it's like an active system. Ah. But there's yes. no equation of state in an active system. No, so it's okay. Um, this is typically for a beer. Joker. Uh, I mean, so whether grains are active, not active, I mean, already it would take me a bit of time to, to answer this. In some sense, yes. In some other sense, no. Uh, and then about the equation of state, there is no equation of state in, uh, in active systems, except for uh, systems that do not experience torque, that are simple uh, spherical particles, where there is one. This is the exception. Uh, OK, so the grains, of course, where do you locate them in this discussion uh, is not clear. There is no persistence in the direction here. So you're, you're trying to mimic thermal fluctuations. Yes. Right? And so one would hope that you could make like an effect in. I don't really need it. I would say, OK, let's say that uh, I have a dynamics with some kind of well-defined kinetic energy. And okay, at equilibrium, I would take the temperature to measure this kinetic energy. And then, because it's equilibrium, I have theories that I can develop. Here, I have the same observable kinetic energy. I can look at it. I cannot claim that I have access to the same theory, but I have the same phenomenology. But when you do cycles, are you sure that you get exactly at the same point? At the same point, uh, it's so one cent. In terms of packing fraction, yes, it's okay. super precise. But uh, you are not exactly at the same pressure? Or <laughs> are you exactly uh, no, it's a fluctuating quantity, the pressure. No, no, it's true. It's true that it's, uh, I control my phi at, but not my p at. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Ah, the, oh, well, that's very easy. I mean, I know the size of the grains with a precision that is uh, like crazy. Yeah, up to, and then the volume you have, uh, you have this uh, this big cell, and so maybe the okay, maybe the value of the packing fraction has some error, but then it's the same all the way around. So I have some given size. And then I have this wall, and the wall I can tune it, and I can move it by 10 micron by 10 micron. So what I measure really is the relative delta phi when I move this wall. And so 10 micron by 10 micron on 50 centimeter, that's why I have resolution like mad for the packing fraction. Uh, similar question. How do you measure the, the pressure? You use a force sensor. Okay. And uh, it's fluctuating like mad, and you average. Okay. The problem all being. The walls. You average over yes, all the yes. The problem being that force sensors have a dynamical range where they can work, and you want to measure press quite weak pressure, and that's why you cannot compress like mad. I mean, we broke a number of force sensors on the way. Mm. So the I have question. a real experimental question. Yes. Which is, uh, if you do your analysis and you split your particles between the two sizes that yes. you have, Given the fact that you're in 2D, but you're not really 2D, so the ones that are smaller should have more room to move, right? Mm -hmm. Then do you see that there is a bias in the chi-4? Uh, so I have, a, I have a, a real experimentalist racking? answer yeah. to this question. Excellent. We didn't do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we could do it. I just reminded no, me no. because I said, OK, you're sure. not, how do you know in 2D? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I, I have to cut questions because we have to go, but it, it will take uh, 20, 25 minutes to go walking, so you have Olivier. <laughs> 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 <laughs>